bravery, courage. You're both very much associated with that word. What takes the most courage for you in being a writer? I don't think it's like if whenever I hear actors talk about like how brave they are, like nothing I do takes a particular amount of courage. Like I'm a lucky dude. I get to sit in a fucking room and not have anybody fuck with me unless I want to. And people pay me for it. Um, I get, you know, I travel all over. My books are published all over the world. I travel all over the world. Um, you know, I, I'm in a position of of great privilege. Um, in well, part, thanks for the humility. But does anything you do ever scare you? Are you ever afraid? Do you ever have to push past something? No, I think I think I always I always like I'm. If I'm not scared about certain things I'm trying to do in a book, like I'm not doing it right. Like, but but fear of what you're writing when you're alone in a room is very different than like real fear. Like I'm not a I'm not a cop. I'm not a I'm not a soldier. I'm not a fireman. Um, it's funny because for me, again, with the fiction more than nonfiction, I feel like. I'm pretty terrified to surrender to what's unfolding, kind of what we were talking about. And um, if someone asked me that question, I would probably say letting my novel end the way it did, even though I had this beautiful outline for how it was supposed to end and laying the groundwork for a sequel. Um, so I'm wondering more about in your writing. I'm talking about that kind of courage, not that anybody's going to shoot at you, at least not while you're in your office. But Wait, I get threatened with that. I'm sure you do. <laughs> Um, you know, is it courage? It's like some you take risks. Is it hard? I guess what I meant. No, it's like if you're not doing it, you're not doing it right, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Like mm -hmm. it, it, it would be um, really easy to write a safe book, mm -hmm. and it's harder to write one that's not safe. And it's like I don't want, I won't do it unless it's hard. Like mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but part of what still excites me is like the challenge of it. Like writing a book is a hard thing. Like I have a certain amount of respect for anybody who writes a book, even if it's a shitty book, mm -hmm. or even if I think it's a shitty book, because it's hard to sit there for day after day. And it's like every book you have to confront certain fears and insecurities that you have. You know, the first one is just, can I actually do this? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, you know, if I think risk taking is an important thing, and I think risk taking is what. Um, like I, one of the, my beefs with like literature today is I think most writers don't take huge risks. Like I think so much of um, literary American literary culture is now controlled by academia, and academics are the least risky people in the literary world. Literary culture. I thought you were going to say something else entirely. I thought you were going to say. Um, <coughs> military industrial complex, but... No, like, uh, you know, everybody goes through a writing school, and if you go to a writing school, you're taught to do things, and you're taught to do things in a certain way, and you're taught by people who believe certain things. Often those people can't actually even do the things they're teaching you. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think it's discouraged, like, real risk-taking. I think the, often the bravest, boldest shit comes from outside of that system. Uh, from well, you would, you would uh, um, be an example of... Not I, I actually just, just, Catherine uh, went to the Iowa Writers' Workshop pretty early on. And, um, I, well, I, I also teach in a writing program, mm -hmm. um, and I would say that, and I've worked teaching writing in other places, and all writing programs really they accept the people who they feel have talent and are already writers. And I never had any sense of anybody forming my, I don't think they could have. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you didn't see that with your fellow students, that they were being influenced by the teachers? Well, if they were, then they're the kind of people who might be influenced by anything. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> no, but seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know they they don't mean. have this sort of voice or vision that is their own, so they're easily budgetable. Mm -hmm. But generally, um, that's the very thing that I'm looking for. I mean, reading applications right now. Mm -hmm. I want the person who I can't push around because mm -hmm. they're already stylists in their own way and they already have their own. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, but, mm -hmm. but I can only speak to my own experience. Yeah, that's what you're here for. 
<laughs> um, what time is it? Because I want to make sure we leave. Uh, Does anybody know the time? Ten to. What is it? Ten to. Okay, okay, I think it's time to ask questions. Well, I want to ask one last thing. One of the questions I asked everybody in the book, the 20 writers, was what their greatest moment was as a writer in the writing lives. And um, only two out of 20 referred to a commercial moment. The other 18 all spoke about a moment of exhilaration or triumph or uh, a very quiet moment. Of, of joy with b between themselves and the work they were doing. Is that true? I think you, you um, were one of the 18, as I recall. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, um, I always, the, the old thing from <clears throat> science about that, they say that a pigeon will peck 1,000 times for a ne and the next kernel of corn having gotten one. Um, and I really feel like that's what it's like. I mean, the kernel is great. I mean, there are these moments that are completely transcendent where just for one second, you know, everything has this beauty and order and you have, you have the sense maybe that you just got it right, exactly right, mm -hmm. um, and that you'll be able, that it will communicate what you want. Um, you know, those are relatively uh, brief moments, um, but they are, very seductive. I mean, yeah. I think once you get that, then you just want to go back and have it happen again. What percentage of the time when you have a moment like that does it do you, does it turn out to stay in the book the way it came out? Almost always. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and for you, same or not? Well, like I said, everything I put stays in the book because I don't uh -huh. read it or edit it. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess I mean more like when. You know, I used to write, uh, as an experiment, I was doing a book of collected essays, and I wrote one of them when I was totally high on pot. And I gave them all to my editor to see if she could tell, and she said, that one has to go, it really sucks. <laughs> Just an experiment. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like that thing when you wake up the next morning and your brilliant idea is not smart anymore. So, and there's a word for that. idea. Just to have a few ideas. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think my best moments are when I type the, type the last word. Like the best moment ever was when I finished the first book. That mm. I was, it was like two in the morning. I was by myself. I had been working for probably fourteen hours that day trying to get finished. It had taken a year, and. Uh, and I finished it, and I and I like I literally started crying by myself in front of a computer. I was 31, um, and it was great. And I always now finish books late at night um, by myself, usually after really long days or multiple long days in a row, much longer than I would normally put in. And it's like you finish. And it's I don't know. It's a great feeling. Mm -hmm. um, it's like it's, it's nice. I mean, there are better ones in life, but it's nice. Yeah. I was on the way here. I was. Uh, I had a driver to get me here, and um, he he picked me up at the airport. Then he took me to a hotel. Then he took me here. And in each case, he would say, um, you know, I'd say, do we have enough time to do this? Do we have enough time to do that? And he would say, okay, well, we're going to drive on the Van Wick until we get here, and there's going to be a bottleneck right here, and that's going to take us exactly 17 minutes to get from here to here, and then. You know, and then we were driving, and there was an accident, and his whole plan. Yeah, you know, so it it really reminded me of this process. Like you sit down, at least for me, I always work with an outline. I have an idea of where I'm going. I think I know how it's going to turn out, and then sometimes there's an accident. Yeah, I mean, the books that I've outlined, I've been too bored to write. <laughs> no, because I need. To, yeah. I, I'm. It's usually it's a process of discovery. I don't know where it's going to end up. So you know, I have because I think it'd be really nice to work from an outline. <laughs> I mean, it sounds really great. Even when you do nonfiction, you don't work from an outline? That's amazing. Um, well, I've been pressed to provide them, so I do make yeah. them up, but they don't necessarily reflect what yeah. the book turns yeah. out to be. Um, I remember when I threw my first book in, it was with Bantam, and the publisher came down to meet me and shook my hand, and he said, you gave us what you said you were going to give us. <laughs> and he looked absolutely stunned. And yeah. I said, Is there another way to do this? <laughs> I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> Anyway, so let's take questions. Um, yes. Yeah, uh, apropos of vision, um, 
you know, if you think of American writers in, let's say, the 20th century, there are certain writers, very few, who represent a certain time. Um, you know, Hemingway and Fitzgerald would represent after the First World War. Uh, Arthur Miller might represent the 30s, um, you know, the Depression and, and the effects of that. And I was just wondering if you thought of any writers represented, um, you know, the last 10 years of the last century and maybe the first 10 years of it. Um, you know, you might think um, of McCarthy, what's his name? McCarthy. Uh, Cormac McCarthy, yeah. Uh, I was just wondering what you're, you know, are we uh, in an apocalyptic time? Um, you're asking me that? Any, I got kicked out of high school. I, mean, <laughs> I think I'm here. I mean, I, I'm I mean, just I wondering think, if you think yeah. any writers uh, represent their time at this time. I think Dave Foster Wallace represents the 90s. Um, I don't think we know yet who represents the hmm. first 10 years of this century. We'll know in 10 more years. Um, you know, I don't. You, you need time to see who, mm. who, who, who does. It's interesting. I mean, you said apocalyptic. I think, and um, certainly with um, young adult mm. literature, we've seen just a huge number mm. of dystopias, uh, just mm. one after another. I think it's sort of coming to an end, but. Um, I think it's maybe easier to see ideological patterns more than to say that one particular person mm -hmm. is the face of mm -hmm. an entire generation or something. Mm -hmm. That's um, interesting, yeah. I, when I did a couple of journalism books about teenagers, and one thing, and that was about 10 years ago, and I noticed people always say teenagers have no sense of mortality, and they think they're going to live forever, and all the kids I worked with over this three-year period of doing these two books, they all thought they were going to be dead when they were 18. Mm -hmm. and, one of them was right, um, but um, yeah, that's interesting. I guess in answer to your question, for me, it's who's in the book. I mean, it's not that I sat there and said who were the greatest or the this or the most representative, but I really made an effort to sort of, you know. Yeah, I know. I was just wondering. Capture yeah. a zeitgeist of some kind because I think every one of the writers in the book um, represents something, not necessarily everything. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, a, 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 writer, a writer who represents a certain time, uh -huh. you know, it comes, across, comes along very rarely. Mm -hmm. And I think for Brett Ellis in the 80s, yeah, that's what I was David thinking. Foster maybe, Wallace in the 90s, and we don't maybe know. Maybe American Psycho. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny, another thing is one that I found from interviewing um, the people in the book who are, I'd say it's probably a little more what's considered literary than commercial. Uh, but I was attempting to get a balance of the two. Um, the commercial, commercially successful writers told me they were totally resentful about the fact that they never got reviewed. And the <laughs> literary writers told me they were resentful about not selling enough books. <laughs> so um, some do both, but it's pretty unusual. And that was part of what I wanted the conversation to be in the book. Well, so much of it is determined, of course, by the publisher and selling it. And I remember um, when I was um, doing the National Book Award for the, I chaired the fiction that we had so many arguments about, is this a literary novel? Yes or no. If it's not a literary novel, can we still mm -hmm. like think about maybe giving it a prize <laughs> or something? And just, you know, it was really very difficult because um, a lot to do with packaging. Mm -hmm. uh, that's right, yeah. And marketing, which yeah. is, um, you, know, you know, there's wonderful work that comes out within genres. Um, and I think Gone really Girl is an example of that. I don't know if you read that. Um, Maybe you didn't like it. I loved it. And I was real, it's not a book I would have read in a million years if I hadn't gotten a, an idea from someone that it was yeah. actually a good book. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, as an aspiring writer, a year away from graduation from my undergrad, um, how do you, like, how important do you feel um, having, like, an online platform is? Because I feel like at this age, it's almost expected to be, right, like, everybody who writes a blog thinks they're a writer these days. And I just wonder, how do you compete in this, like, online world where everybody's self-publishing and, um, 
And if you don't personally have an online platform, how important is it for you guys? You just self-published, essentially, didn't you? You did an ebook. I mean, we did. I did a weird hybrid of yeah, it. Yeah. Um, what can you say something about that? Because I thought that was really interesting. I mean, the last book I wrote outside of the United States, it was released in a very traditional, normal way inside of the United States. I didn't want to sell it to a publisher because I know what big publishers do when books cause trouble. Mm -hmm. and what they do is they turn and they run as fast as they can. Um, and so we knew the book was going to cause trouble. So um, <clears throat> I went to art school, and I have always been very involved with art. I write essays for artists. I write, I don't really write essays, I write things for their books. So I write for Damien Hirst and Ed Ruscha and Richard Prince and um, and so I went to Gagosian, the art gallery, um, and I said, will you publish this book? They publish 200 books a year, they're all art books. They had never published a novel before. But I said, will you publish this book? Um, and so we published the book through Gagosian, and I didn't want to sell however many copies I could. Writing that book and releasing that book was not about selling as many copies as I could. It was about making something that I wanted to make the way I wanted to make it. And so we produced 10,000 copies of the book um, that were highly, highly produced and very expensive. So nor a normal book that a publisher releases costs about two bucks, it costs publisher two bucks to make it. We did an edition of 10,000 and then a separate edition of 1,000. And the, the books, that, the 10,000 edition, um, they cost us about $30 a book to make. And we sold them for 50. And the, the thousand edition, the books cost about $80 to make. And we sold them for 150 bucks. So I had this very um, beautiful, highly produced thing that was published by the fanciest art gallery in the world. And then I just released the book on, uh, digitally on my own. Um, again, whatever problems were going to occur, we're, we're going to be me dealing with them now. Like, and I'm going to deal with them in a different way than a large multinational corporation is going to deal with them. I have the liberty of being able to say, fuck you. <laughs> um, and they often don't. Um, as far as to answer more directly your question, I don't think you need to publish your writing online. I actually think that's a detriment. It takes it something mm -hmm. away from it. It makes it less special. Like, I, I think part of writing a book is you shouldn't, I don't think you should do, genre books is fine, but I think in certain ways you shouldn't do too much of anything because then people get tired of it. That you have to, we always, me and my agent always say, sort of when I release a book, we refer to it as the circus. The circus is coming to town. Um, because you want to make an event of it. You want to make it something that doesn't happen every day. You want to make it something that people will pay attention to. The more attention people pay, the more books are sold the more people read you. Um, so we always say the circus is coming to town. If I have the circus open every single day, nobody's going to give a shit. Um, so that's in one side of it. On the other side of it, I think it is important to constantly communicate with the people who read your books. So I have a website. People write to me every day through it. I, I write a lot of them back. I've, you like, write a blog too, or you did. It doesn't look like you're... I don't do the blog much. anymore, yeah. like I say yes or no to what goes on the blog. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a Facebook page, I communicate with people, I think that's important to do. I think, like, I always say if somebody's going to spend their money, like in today's world especially, everybody here has a choice. How are you going to spend your money and how are you going to spend your time? And if you're going to spend your money and your time on me, then it's my responsibility to show you some respect and, and, and thank you for it. And if it's writing it. A thank you, you know, somebody writes me a letter, I just write, thank you, I, I profoundly appreciate that. So, like, that's your responsibility as, like, a person. Um, but I think it's important to have an online presence. Just not, like, also, aside from making things special, like, you, you can either put all your energy into a book, or you can put your energy into a blog, and I'll choose a book. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I you don't um, do it much. No, and I, I do believe that familiarity breeds contempt, and I am not somebody who uh, I revise a lot. I mean, the last thing that I would ever think to do was to write a blog. Um, you know, I don't do much Facebook or Twitter either. You're there. I don't tweet. Very, 
Oh, you don't tweet at all. Yeah, um, you're on Facebook a little tiny bit. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, of course, I respond to people who take the trouble to write to me. Um, yeah. But uh, I would say that the thing that um, you owe most of your attention to is the words that you put on the page, and I, you know, that's really the first thing that needs to be in place, and all the rest will follow. And none of the rest means as much. Mm -hmm. Sort of the cart before the horse in a way. Mm. I read, I, I was reading a, a blog by a social <laughs> media expert for authors, and she said you should do what you like to do. And yeah, that was a revelation yeah, to me because I go through phases where I like, at one point I thought if I could actually express myself in 140 characters, that would be a revelation for me. <laughs> I can't do it in 140 hours. Um, so I got really into Twitter for about six months and I was tweeting like crazy only because I enjoyed it. I didn't have a book coming out or anything, which is fun. And I like the discipline of the limitation. And then I got totally over Twitter. Like one day I just woke up and was like, never again. And, and, then I, and then I got back into Facebook because I moved to Los Angeles and it's so photogenic. And I just started taking pictures and it made me feel like less lonely and less like I was a stranger in a new town because people would then respond to the picture and say, oh yeah, I was there and whatever, it's more communication rather than, and now I'm just in full out porn mode. I mean, now it's just like, thanks to my wonderful publicist, Liz, she gives me so much to post about that I just my, um, do it. <laughs> my Facebook uh, presence is um, hardly rational. My son, uh, who is now 20, Facebook, and he was in high school at the time or something, and um, I came in the room and, you know, stilled by his laptop, and, <laughs> and I went back to my desk, I said, you know, Walker, I can have a Facebook page, too, and, uh, and I started making a howl of rage, no, <laughs> I have a face, like, whoa, okay, fine, I didn't really want one, um, but, you know, Facebook, once you begin, they will come back to you, and so I would get these little messages, Catherine, <laughs> you came and started your Facebook page and then you quit. <laughs> so this happens to me at about 3 in the morning when I've been writing for a really long time. And um, I did something, I'm not really a cynical person, but I did make, um, I did begin Facebook with a rather cynical experiment, which was that I friended everybody who had ever said anything horrible about me. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> well, that must have taken a lot of time. Um, <laughs> social experiment and you know some of the things that were said about me were quite horrible yes um, <laughs> you know hey yes so great to reconnect <laughs> and now i swear i have never friended anybody i have 4300 and something friends who all came from my enemies <laughs> i mean it just it turned into this bizarre snowball but i was actually i was surprised at this <laughs> at the disconnecting. <laughs> um, but there there's a strategy I've never seen. Uh, I, I, do, I just thought, you know, I this would be interesting. Yeah. I do that with reviews. Like, I try to send a thank you note to anybody who reviews my book, mm -hmm. but I definitely always do it to the people who write the bad ones. <laughs> um, just to see what they'll do. And 80% and of them never respond. Mm -hmm. But every now and then, somebody will respond. And um, I think it's funny. I love, I, I and I, I know thing, it makes them mad. For the opposite reason, the last nonfiction book I did was very controversial, and I did get death threats, and it was a big deal. And um, so I went on Amazon, and every person who wrote like scary, not like there's a fine line, like the total psychotics. Oh, you're talking about like the be I'm my life virgin. <laughs> I am. I'm scared of it. I'm not going there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, I would write to them and say, I understand you know, what you're saying, and try to sort of unite with them on one point and then draw them out. And it was actually good practice for the presidential campaign because when you go knocking on doors, you have to know how to sort of find some point of conversation. What, yes. What book are you talking about? It's my my yeah, lie. That, that, um, that you had so much vitriol from people on Amazon. Um, in my case, I wrote a book about having falsely accused my father of molesting me. It was called My Lie, A True Story of False Memory. So there were, there were scary people. I mean, I think probably 
some of the same scary years, Yeah, 20 years <laughs> later, 10 years later, whatever it is. Yeah, the same guys. Oh, Catherine's not giving us anything to do right now. So get on there. So what kind of yes. people were threatening you? I mean, were these other people from the false memory community? Yeah, some, but, you know, it's easy to say that. It's kind of like saying Republicans are assholes. I mean, some of the people who, you know, I could easily have just said, well, you know, there's this very well-organized movement of, uh, fathers who mostly fathers who feel or stay, say that they've been falsely accused, um, but you know, some of those I, I don't know who those people are. How can I know that? You know what I mean? So I just tried to take it as um, I never believed a single one of them when they wrote. I mean, I would get these long letters about how they were being falsely accused, and you know, it would go back like 20 years and every detail, pages and pages, and. Um, a lot of them I would just read one sentence and say, you did it, you motherfucker, I know you did. You know? I mean, I don't know how, I just, you know, and others I would say, I would write them really sympathetic letters because I really hurt my father like that and my father wasn't the only one to get hurt that way, that's why I wrote a book about it, you know. Um, but I don't know if you can tell sort of, we both had plenty of hate mail. Um, um, I'm interested because I am such, I am so polarized myself and I'm so opinionated and so judgmental and so arrogant about my own opinions that for me it's kind of a growth experience to try to find something, again, with the Obama campaign, mostly in 2008, I had to know how to do that and, um, you know, I didn't. I didn't know how to do that. I did not know how to find common ground and so depending on why they're, screaming at you, um, if they're screaming at you because they did molest their daughters and they don't like being accused of it or having gone to jail for it, well, I'm not really going to try to find common ground with you, but, you know, um, I don't know. You don't like being attacked <laughs> and character assassinated. Um, well, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it's a choice. You don't care. I mean, it, sometimes it hurts, but it's like, fuck it. And you moved, right? You moved your family away. We right? moved. We left the country not because of that. We left the country because I could not walk out the door without being followed by paparazzi. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, in, in 2006 we left and went lived in France. Um, and came back. I came back. I mean, we have, we have, this sounds ridiculous. We have he used to have long blonde hair. He's wearing a disguise right now, <laughs> so it's really working for him. Nobody calls him. I mean, we have security. Um, uh -huh. When we have threat issues, we have somebody we send a letter to. And, and usually we only consider a real threat if we get more than one of them from the same person. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times, guys will get angry, somebody will get angry on the internet and write something nasty and send it to you. Like, who gives a fuck? Um, a lot of times I'll write it back. I'll be like, thanks, dude, that was an awesome note. <laughs> but if you get something more than once, um, you usually And, and you know, we 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 have, we've had two cases where we actually we had one case in 2006 where a guy was sending me multiple threatening letters. One of them, the last one, he threatened to cut my head off. Wow. So the security people, the way they often handle this shit is they they went to it was coming from Seattle. You can trace where an email comes from generally. So the security people flew to Seattle. They went to the local FBI office. They showed the FBI the the stuff. You don't usually want to make a big public. FBI agents with the security people go to this person's house and they literally knock on the door. They hand the dude the emails and they say, we know you're sending these. If you keep sending them, we will come back and arrest you. And then they stop. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think we have time oh. for just one more question. Okay. Um, my question is one about craft. At the very beginning of the evening, you uh, said something about um, either both of you or one of you, something about um, writing something and either changing it either at the last minute or during the process from fiction to nonfiction or from non you know from memoir to fiction could you could could either all three of you or at least Catherine and um, James talk about fiction versus nonfiction? I, my first novel was a typically autobiographical first novel. You know, I was young and I had my own story and I disguised it um, as much as my publisher's lawyer told me I had to. Um, you know, it was just one of those books where I never said this is true or it's based on a true story. It just sort of felt that way. Um, but 
what I didn't understand um, was that I would be left feeling as if I had complied with the sort of cultural um, imperative to never speak about incest, that I had told the story, and that in fact I had said I made it up. Um, so that, that was painful in a way that I never would have understood had I not gone through it, but as time went on, it became more important for me to, to own that story as mine. Um, and I read that you said that you felt like you were colluding with the story that this doesn't happen. Yeah, I mean, or that, you know, I just sort of yeah, said, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, I really, I did, I did not like that feeling. Um, yeah, I, by the time I wrote The Kiss, I felt, you know, that I'd been, that I'd been silent for a long time about something that I needed to talk about, and I don't know mm -hmm. who needed to hear about it or, or whatever, but I just, um, I had to rectify that mm. as a human being and as a writer. So, I mean, that's sort of a large craft question. Uh, you know, the first novel, everybody was wearing costumes, and, you know, the jobs were changed, and all, you know, numbers of siblings, and all sorts of things like that. Um, and then with the memoir, I was, um, I was pretty rigorously careful to honor the truth as best I could as a fallible human being. Um, so that was, uh, but, at, but at that point, I'd, I'd written the book and revised it in my head so many times that it wasn't mm -hmm. a lot about revising mm -hmm. afterwards. Last week, I did an event with two of the people who are in the book, uh, Terry McMillan, who's a fiction writer, of course, and Susan Orlean, who is a very precise journalist. And um, somebody in the audience asked Susan how she reconstructs or constructs or creates dialogue between characters when she wasn't in the room, and she really got mad, and she said, you know, I'm a journalist, I don't make anything up. And Terry immediately said, I'm a novelist, I never make anything up. You know, and they both said, we're both, I mean, it was really fabulous to have the two of them in the room, because they felt like exactly why the book exists, you know, and they were both saying they do everything they do to get to the truth, and there are lots of ways to get to it. I make shit up. <laughs> I make all sorts of shit up. Um, and I think I'm allowed to. Like, I sit down to write a book. When I wrote A Million Little Pieces, I didn't sit down to write a memoir. I never, I just sat down to write a book. And when I was mentioning the writers I, I, I mentioned earlier, like Baudelaire or Rimbaud or um, Henry Miller or, or Jack Kerouac or Charles Bukowski, these are all people who essentially wrote about their lives. And, and I don't think they had to deal with what we deal with now. Like, they didn't have to sit down and think, okay, this is what it is. Or where it's going to be shelved. In the or where it's going to be shelved. And, you know, I was talking earlier how I come out of an art education more than, a, 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 than any sort of writing education. And in art, you're taught that you don't classify shit like that. Like, if I put a painting up here, you wouldn't say, well, <clears throat> This is a beautiful non-fiction painting. <laughs> this is a beautiful fiction painting. Or this is, it's just a fucking painting. And so when I was writing a million pieces, it was just I wrote a fucking book. And I just tried to make it as good as I could. And I didn't give a shit if I changed stuff or I embellished stuff or I made stuff up. And I still don't. When we were, conf when I had to deal with that is we sent the book out. When I got an agent, we sent the book out. The book was sent to publishers as a novel. Um, publisher bought it and it was like, we're going to sell a lot more copies if um, we can publish this as a memoir um, and you'll go out and promote it like that. And I was like, I don't give a fuck. Just send me out. And I, they sent me out. And, and it blew up. Um, and I don't really have any regrets about it. Like, people call me a liar or call me names and shit. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. Like, what will ultimately matter with that book? And that book, like, sells two to three hundred thousand copies a year, ten years after it came out. And like, the only thing that matters is if, if that book is good enough, people will still read it. And if it's not, they won't. Um, and, and good enough is what does it do to you when it reads, when you read it. And it's like, when I sit down and write a book, like, it doesn't factor in. Like, if anything now, I fuck around deliberately, like, bright, shiny morning. Um, is this book that's fiction, which is stacked with information that looks like it's nonfiction, 
which is probably half of it is real and half of it's made up. And it was like a very deliberate mind fuck mm. to, 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 to destroy the idea that you could read anything in that book and figure out if it was real or not and whether it even mattered. Um, and you know, the, the publisher, as they do now, they wanted to say, bright, shiny morning, a novel. And I was like, no, you're not, it's not, that's not the fucking title. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't write a book called a novel. It's a fucking book called Bright, Shiny Morning, and that's all it's called. Um, and for me, at least, and, and you know, different people work differently. These guys work differently and think differently and have different lives and different experiences and different educations than me. I sit down and I don't get, it's like, what can I do to fuck you up? And when I say I want to fuck a, re write, a reader up, like, I want you to feel shit in very real and profound ways, whether whether that's love for what I do or hate for what I do, whether it's like make you laugh or smile, scare you, sort of make you have to stop. Like when I wrote A Million Little Pieces, literally one of the goals was to write a book that nobody could read without having to close it at some point because they couldn't deal with what I was doing to them. Um, and I try to do that with everything. And it's like, once you place restrictions and rules and labels and shit on what you do, you're limiting what you can do. And, and I don't think you should have to do that. Let's end on a note of no limitations. <laughs>